uh, I will, uh, after a small introduction uh, of the burden barrier, I will just be tell you how we make it with the in vitro models uh, to address the blood-brain barrier issues. So we are uh, a, laboratory, a laboratory which is dedicated, focused on the blood-brain barrier in vitro. So its name is the Laboratory of Pathophysiology of the Blood-Brain Barrier. We, it's headed by Professor Romeo Sekeli, and we are located in Lens. It's a small town in the north of France, close to Lille, about 40 kilometers, and about 200 kilometers from Paris. And uh, we are a very small university, which is called the University of Artois, but in the, in the northern part of France, the universities are more or less connected to the, uh, the big university of Lille, Nord de France. So in the lab, we have a big um, staff for technical, technical issues because our model was uh, really involved and used by pharmaceutical industry, and I will explain you why. And uh, we are, so many people are working on the same batches of cells to allow for um, quality control. And uh, among these, uh, these people, there are some topical uh, teams which are, uh, uh, which, which are uh, uh, set up uh, uh, around these technical issues. So one is dedicated to the models of the neurovascular unit, so it improved the models. One dedicated to the stroke, and this is the one I'm, I'm working in. One in pharmacotoxicology, one on proteomics of the blood-brain barrier, and the last one and newest one on cholesterol and Alzheimer's disease. So the blood-brain barrier exists um, since early in 1885, um, tried to inject some dyes intravenously in the mouse, and he discovered that all the organs of the mouse were stained except the brain. And at that time, it was interpreted as a lack of affinity of the dye for the brain tissue. And, but an uh, early student, Goldman, has managed to inject uh, the dye in the ventricles of the brain because it was technically challenging at that time. And he discovered that more of the, the brain was stained, so the, his boss was wrong. And moreover, that the dye could not diffuse to the other organs. So he discovered that there was a barrier between the brain and the blood. And it, came to, it took several years to uh, have the real term blood-brain barrier. And when I say blood-brain barrier, I talk about the, the brain endothelium. I mean, the endothelium of lining the microvessels uh, coming from the penetrating arteries in the brain parenchyma. There are some endothelia also in other parts of the brain, in the dura, in the arachnoid, or in the toroid plexuses. These are leaky in the sense that they do not form a barrier. They do not restrict the passage of substances from the blood to the brain. The, what makes a barrier in the arachnoid is the epithelium, as well as in the choroid plexuses. But in the blood-brain barrier, it is the endothelium that makes the barrier inside the parenchyma, except for circumventricular organs. And to be uh, even more precise, uh, this blood-brain barrier is located in the brain capillaries. So why in, in the brain capillaries? Why not in the arterioles or in the venules? Because the brain capillaries of the brain are the main site of exchange between the brain and the blood, like in other organs, in fact. So the barrier properties are there to protect the brain for the variations in the composition of the plasma. And in this sense, by exerting the barrier uh, properties on this, all the capillaries, the blood uh, brain barrier protects the brain. So when I talk about capillaries, I would say the vessel that with a diameter less than 10 microns, because I know that in preparation, histological preparation, it's always a big issue when you, to see whether we are in front of a arterial or venule or uh, capillary. When it's less than 10 microns, we can assume that we are in the capillary bed. And so how it works? The difference between the capillaries in the peripheral system and in the central nervous system is that the, the most of the compounds that are hydrophilic and are coming from the blood can diffuse in the peripheral capillaries through the paracellular pathway so I mean between the cells or through fenestration, 
in the case of fenestrated capillaries, or through the numerous pinocytotic vesicles that can undergo transcytosis. In the brain, the capillaries have tight junctions that seal completely the paracellular way. So the, all, there are very few pinocytotic vesicles, and they, so the, most of the compounds have to cross the endothelium through uh, a lot of uh, highly regulated pathways to reach the brain. So in this way, the blood-brain barrier restricts the exchange between the, with, with the blood. And these physical and metabolical um, barrier properties are induced by the astrocytic end feet all around the vessel. And it's induced during the development and also maintained during the head of food. So the endothelial cells of brain capillaries have what we call restrictive properties. Tight junction proteins, which are above the adherence junction proteins, a lot of degradating enzymes, and also efflux pumps, these, which are some a kind of um, transmembrane proteins that can pull, uh, pump out all the a wide spectrum of um, compounds which are mainly lipophilic. But the compounds need to enter the brain, at least the nutrients, and so the, the highly regulated pathway I was talking before, it's a lot of uh, amino acid transporters and glucose transporter systems that can um, allow the passage of a wide spectrum of, uh, of compounds, and also there are many receptors also present at the blood-brain barrier, uh, which allow some blood-brain proteins to cross uh, with a low speed, but at least to cross the blood-brain barrier. So in this sense, this barrier is not only a no-sense barrier. It's selective barrier because it can allow some compounds to cross, but through highly specialized pathway. But the endothelial cell is not alone in the capillary. It is surrounded by astrocytic end feet. Almost, mm, almost all the capillaries are completely surrounded by the uh, astrocytic end feet. There are some pericytes which are embedded in the, uh, in the collagen matrix. Um, pericytes are more or less um, smooth muscle cells of the capillaries. And there are all the perivascular cells which belong to the brain tissue. So the neurons, of course, the oligodendrocytes, and the microglial cells. All these cells are com communicating together. And we don't know exactly why, especially in, in, uh, in pathologies. And, but at least these cells are recognized now as a functional unit termed the neurovascular unit. And the problem is that this neurovascular unit is there to regulate the exchanges between the blood and the brain. And these barrier properties, even if it's selective, it prevents most of the neuropharmaceutical compounds to reach the brain and to exert a pharmacological effect. And this was the first interest in studying the blood-brain barrier for about 20 years ago, is to know how the compounds can cross the barrier and reach the brain. So that's why many pharmaceutical companies were interested in this, in this topic and in our model because it was easy to handle compared to animals. Because when you come to assess the brain penetration of compounds, you can have different models. First, the in silico models, which are getting more and more int uh, interesting in the in, uh, nowadays because they can um, predict the uh, interaction of molecules with center compounds of the uh, bilayer membrane, but they are quite virtual. In vivo models, which are complete, but the problem is that when you tr inject a compound and that could reach the brain, how could you make the difference in the dosage between the compound which is still inside the capillary, in the endothelial, stick to the collagen, or really in the brain parenchyma? So that's why in, be that's why in between we have in vitro models, which are a, ki a, uh, a kind of compromise because we can achieve BBB permeability measurement, I would say, but there are two of them, two types, synthetics, which, we, which are called the PAMPA membranes. I don't know if you have ever heard about these kind of uh, lipid bilayers that were uh, set out in big plates. They can assess the, the interaction of compound with this kind of membranes, and they try to, uh, to mimic the blood-brain barrier, but 
they can, there is a lack of cellular events, of course, and the cell-based model, which seems to be the best way to, and the easiest way to assess the brain permeability. The problem is that it's not easy to, to perform because you need physiological relevance to have good permeability values which are really relevant to what exists in vivo. So, in the literature, the classical method which was used to extract the microvessels and to set up a blood-brain barrier endothelium monolayer is to use gray matter and to uh, perform enzymatic digestion followed by centrifugation. The problem is that you have isolated microvessels with a lot of endothelial cells which come from the capillaries but also from the arterioles and all the venules because you digest everything. And also, since you are digesting, you're removing the collagen and so you release the pericytes. And the pericytes are growing much more quicker than, uh, faster than the endothelial cells. So you can have a primary culture of microvessel endothelial cells, but you have to take care about the proportion of pericytes because they are growing quite quick. The method that I've been set up by the Romeo Sekeli is based on only on mechanical homozygization steps. In this way, you have isolated microvessels that you look under your microscope and you mark them wh whenever you have a, this kind of a, a real capillary. And this capillary, you can uh, see it on extracellular matrix. And once you have it on the cellular matrix, it can bind specifically to this matrix. And by washing procedure, you can discard the arterioles and the venules, mainly. And after that, from these capillaries, you can have a, a pure culture of capillary endothelial cells reflecting the DDD. So it looks like this. Which, this is a capillary which is uh, binding to the extracellular matrix. So how can we see it's a capillary because it's really thin? And here you have... Um, you have a white blood cell which is completely uh, stuck to the, I mean, which uh, keep the shape of the, of the vessel because it's completely linear. And after a certain time, one endothelial cell can go out from the capillary. And this happens only in the bovine model. I mean, with the capillaries that are extracted from bovine brain. We have tried this with... Um, uh, mouse model with the mouse, with the rat, and even with the human, and it does not behave like this for the time being. So, and when we have this, the, 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 what is really important is that the endothelial cells it can grow and form a colony, and since you have this colony, you can microtrepsinize it and seed it on other plates, and then if you have taken too many parasites at this at this stage, you can have the pericytes there that are growing faster than the endothelial cells, and then you have a culture of pericytes. Or if you have not taken a lot of pericytes, you can have, um, I mean, the endothelial cell wins the competition, and you have a, beauty, a beautiful monolayer of endothelial cells which are easily recognizable because they are spindle-shaped, and they are uh, making some wave in the culture. So here you can see uh, the spindle shape of this endothelial cell with the really big nuclei, nucleus there, thanks to the uh, staining with vimentin. And here you have uh, occludin, which is uh, one of the um, tight junction proteins. Here you can see that this tight junction protein is surrounding each endothelial cell. And at the cell borders, these uh, proteins are really uh, form a continuous network. And this is the particularity of the blood-brain barrier. Oh yes, and I forgot. By to, to assess for the tightness of this monolayer of endothelial cells, we usually, not, not now because it's really difficult to, uh, it's really variable, but it's used to, to be uh, the um, endothelial resistance, the measurement of the endothelial resistance across the monolayer. It can reach uh, 400 ohm the centimeter square. So I, of course, you could say, but what is it in vivo? In vivo, uh, there were some measurements that were made on the PL arteries, and uh, there were about 2,000 ohms per centimeter square. We do not know about them in capillaries because they are completely embedded in the, in the parenchyma. But we assume that it's more or less the same thing. Something important also is that 
you need to check that the endothelial cells are really brain endothelial cells. And in this way, for example, the uh, brain capillary endothelial cells are binding the LDLs differently from the aortic endothelial cells. So there are many specific features that need to be checked when you culture this type of cells. The problem is that by culturing the cells, you can lose a lot of things that you may not know. For example, this gamma glucosamyl transpeptidase, one of the enzymes present in the blood brain barrier, is sloping down from passage one. And this is a problem because, you know, the, 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 the model we have is not really a primary culture. It's a long-term culture, or what you could find in the literature, a cloned cell. I mean that the cells can grow until confluence, they keep the phenotype, and you can trypsinize them up to seven passages. And after this, they lose their phenotype. So it's interesting because you can use a lot of, uh, of amount compar comparable to uh, primary cells which are extracted from the organ, then they are just seeded on the plate and you use it for once and that's it. But the problem is that they adapt to the, com to the environment and they can lose some, fe uh, some features su such as the uh, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. That's why the professor Sekeli had the idea to co-cultivate these endothelial cells with glial cells, as it is in vivo. Where we can do that by seeding the endothelial cells on the filter insert with the microporous membrane and collagen. And on the bottom of the well, it's six well plates, you can seed glial cells who are which are, sorry, which are coming from uh, brain, newborn right cortex to allow their growth before the confluence. And you need 12 days of co-culture to allow the glial cells to, uh, edu I would say, to induce the blood-brain barrier properties on the endothelial cells. So uh, that's why there are few people that are using this kind of models because it's a lot of work and a lot of money by changing the, the medium and everything. The glial cells, which are seeded a mixture, a mixture of glial cells, so the astrocytes, the oligodendrocyte, and the microglial cells. The proportions are about 60% of astrocytes and 40% of the rest. It's more or less the same in vivo because it's more or less 50-50. So the impact of such a co-culture is that you divide by three the permeability of, com uh, of the barrier to compound. So it improves the, the, the tightness of the blood-brain barrier. And for example, the electrical resistance can, is uh, doubled also. So it really improves the barrier. So uh, how do we measure this uh, permeability uh, by using such a system? In, in fact, after the 12 days of co-culture, you take the filter insert and you place it in another plate containing ringer repass buffer. You add the tested substance also in the buffer on the top of the filter, and then you uh, transfer the filter from one well to another every 15 minutes to uh, avoid any equilibrium between the concentration in case of the compound could cross really rapidly through the blood brain barrier. And what you do is, at first of all, you co-incubate the substance with a, what we call the BBB integrity marker. It's a substance that diffuses very slowly across the blood-brain barrier, what we call a non-permeant molecule. We know this, this value of permeability, and if the value of this, perm of this compound, for, he for instance, is here uh, lucifer yellow, if it increases in the presence of the certain concentration of the tested substance, it means that the substance at this concentration is toxic for the blood-brain barrier. So of course, if it's toxic for the blood-brain barrier, it's allows a pass an increase of the passage of this marker. So, and after that, you do that with, with a concentration range. And after that, you, 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 you um, determine the non-toxic concentrations and you can uh, uh, determine the permeability for the substance on the filter only and on filter with the cell. Because the filter can be also a barrier by itself because some compounds are interacting with the collagen. And so what we calculate is an endothelial permeability coefficient. It's, we use the, the clearance principle. 
So we measure, in fact, a clear volume by unit of time each time we transfer the filter. And by using a linear regression analysis, the slope gives us what we call a PS value, permeability multiplied by the surface. And we do that for the filter only and for the filter with the cells. Total mean filter plus cells. And by using this formula, we determine the PS for the endothelial cells only. And this PS value is further divided by the surface of the filter and we, call, we get what we call PE value, which is in centimeter per minute, so it's a speed. And in translates, it gives us the ability of the compound to cross the endothelium. And what do we do with this, with this value? We can rank, of course, the compounds we, according to the value, and we have determined more or less different categories of compounds. Below 1, 10 minus 3 centimeter per minute, we have low brain penetration compounds. Between 1 and 2, we have the median zone, the area 51 of the blood-brain barrier, because we do not know whether this compound could be CNS compounds or not. May, they may be interacting with some transporters and some other proteins at the membrane. But since uh, they, do, they are not really well penetrating compounds, and above two, we have high brain penetration compounds. So this is very interesting for the pharmaceutical companies to have this in information. But the problem is that having compounds that could reach the brain really easily is also a problem because they can be also toxic. And the same for, uh, I mean, the opposite for the low brain penetration compound. They are less toxic for the brain. So, in fact, we are sometimes um, uh, solicited for uh, some uh, studies to verify if the compound can reach the brain or if a peripheral compound could not reach the brain to have side effects. And regarding these toxicity issues, we are in, uh, involved in uh, European programs which are now focusing on the um, toxicity of our chemical environment according to the directive REACH which uh, impose the countries to uh, register and to study the toxicity of the, all the compounds we import above, of, uh, above one ton per year. So what we are doing in uh, all this all other um, studies addressing the BBB integrity, for example, in pathologies, we use this kind of compounds. These low brain penetration compounds are BBB integrity marker, as I said to you when explaining the, the permeability assay. And what we have determined is that when the permeability for this value is below one, the BBB integrity is okay. I mean, compounds that should not cross this barrier at that speed if they, do, if they are, have a, B, a PE value below one, it means that the endothelial barrier is okay. If it increases, and sometimes it happens, we just prepare the cell, we check the permeability for the sucrose or for the lucifer yellow, and it goes above one, we, we discard the cells. Because when the permeability of these BBB integrity markers is, be, is above one, this ranking is not true anymore. And this is important because we had to uh, validate our model to be a really a good tool of predictability for the brain penetration of compounds because we had to correlate our permeability values with the values we can find in vivo. And of course, it can be very well fitting sometimes, but sometimes not. And uh, we had to, to count with the many partnerships uh, such as AstraZeneca to really increase the number of compounds to be correlated and make sure that we are not far from the reality. But the problem is that the pharmaceutical companies, they are generating a lot of compounds of derivatives thanks to combinatorial chemistry. And so they wanted to have high throughput I would say, uh, models. So uh, we were invited to miniaturize the model from six well played to 12 and even to 24. But at this format, we do not add any uh, glial cells anymore because the proportion between the different uh, glial cells is not um, stable in this such a format. That's why we are using a, 
um, um, condition medium. Something in interesting also that is that you can uh, have um, undergo functional studies dedicated or focusing on one transporter. For example, the pig lycoprotein, which is an efflux pump, uh, we need to check that it is really uh, addressed on the luminal phase on the allophilic cells, that it is present. And you can use inhibitors of this transporter to check that a compound which is which should is, is as a passage which is restricted normally as an increased passage by inhibiting the transporter. And this is the focus, this is the really a target for the pharmaceutical company still, because there, are, there were many, um, many uh, studies that were contradictory, but uh, they're still, uh, they are still confident in the fact that if we inhibit this efflux pump, we improve the passage of the, of the compounds to the brain. But uh, in the use throat network, we are sensitized to the fact that the neurovascular unit is not only at the capillary level. And in pathology, it can involve the arterial or the venule uh, segments of the microvascular tree. So that's why we're trying to, we are trying to design new models which are taking this into account. And first, at the capillary level, we have uh, design a three cell type model, including the pyrocytes, either above the glial cells or just beneath the endothelial cells, just to allow this kind of contact as it is in vivo. It's not easy to set up, but it, it gave a very interesting result, especially if you use some compounds that are targeting the pyrocytes. And regarding in vitro models of larger segments of the microvascular tree, we haven't performed three cell type cultures using, for example, endothelial cells from arterioles, smooth muscle cells from arterioles, and glial cells from, that would be connected to the, to the larger segments, or the same for the venules. But we have at least managed to extract the endothelial cells of the larger segments. It's only morphological assessment. We do not have any molecular marker that could distinguish the arterial, the capillary, or the venule. But at least it's, uh, it's a beginning. So um, trying to understand how the compound, the medical compound, can cross the layer and, and reach the brain is important. But the, in pathology, which is also important, is that the same uh, barrier properties are at the beginning um, pre preserving the brain from the difference in the composition of the blood. And so all the dis uh, disturbance in the uh, function of the blood-brain barrier could um, modify the homeostasis at the neuroglial level and thus promote uh, damage on the brain. So that's why I will give you a few, a few issues that we, are, we have addressed in collaboration with all the people also on stroke. Uh, and you know, you know everything about this, so I think I will not, uh, I will not convince you uh, that the stroke is, really, is a really important pathology. And there are few therapeutic options. And uh, you know also that um, stroke is a brain is disorder of vascular origin. This is something that is really um, well accepted in the stroke field, but not in the neuroscience field, because I, I remember that I was in the neuro, uh, French Neuroscience Society in 2003. I could not fi find more than two posters on the, ves on the brain vessels. Everything was uh, neurons. And uh, 10 years later, and about, about eight years later, uh, it doesn't change. So in, uh, at least in France, it's really difficult to, to talk about vessels to people which are mainly interested in neurons. And it's a pity because they are connected through the neurovascular unit. So stroke, you know that 20 of them are hemorrhagic. 80% are due to the um, occlusion of a brain artery by the thrombus, leaving the downstream area of the brain without um, oxygen and nutrients. So, of course, you have a, a sudden loss of the function. But the problem is that this area, which uh, was uh, touched by stroke, is dying. The cells are dying from the core, I mean the area around the clot, to the, to the downstream segment of the, vas of the vascular tree, where uh, the cells are uh, not functioning but still viable. And of course, if the necrosis 
of the core is reaching the penumbra, in, here you have an infarct and a neurological deficit is in this case irreversible. So the challenge of neuroprotection is to beat the clock to save the cell, brain and brain cell. And something I was really um, impressed is that um, many mechanisms, deleterious mechanisms of stroke were identified, identified a long time ago. And there are many compounds that, are, that were developed to counteract each of these mechanisms. But today there are still no neuroprotectant. Though maybe there is something wrong that we have missed, maybe on the fact that many of these studies were focusing on neurons, but not on the other brain cells, maybe because the compounds were designed against one mechanism and not several of them. So this is something, all the issues that you are interested in in stroke field. And so the only therapy available is to use uh, TPA or, no, or another mean to uh, restore the blood flow as soon as possible. And the problem is that there is a risk because after reperfusion, uh, the blood-brain barrier is more or less leaky, which can lead to um, brain edema, which is worsening the lesion and can promote hemorrhage. So because of this problem of the blood-brain barrier, the TPA therapy is restricted to, to only a few percent of the admitted patients since it has to be uh, given only a few hours uh, after the stroke onset. So with um, the team of Denis Vivien in Caen, we were interested in the TPA transport across the blood-brain barrier. And so they had shown that the TPA was uh, promoting excitotoxicity on neurons. And since the TPA should be injected to patients when the blood-brain barrier, blood barrier is not broken yet, we, the question was, can TPA cross the intact BBB? And by using our model, we just putting some TPA in the medium above the cells, we can see that the TPA was able to cross the blood-brain barrier. And it was able to cross it without disrupting it because the permeability to the, um, the BBB integrative marker is the sucrose was the preserved between the control and the TPA. And you see the difference when you use mannitol, which is uh, a compound used to provoke an osmotic shock. And something in, in important also is that this uh, TPA would cross the BBB independently of its proteolytic acti activity. Because when you use a compound that binds to the proteolytic site of the TPA, the transport is quite the same. Because at that time, there was researchers that were saying that the TPA was degrading the blood-brain barrier through its proteolytic activity. So we investigate the mechanism and we discovered that it was a, ve a transcytotic vesicle and it was saturable, so we were suspecting the involvement of a receptor. And we found that this receptor should be the LDL-related receptor protein, the LRP. And um, by using, we, we, we evidenced that by using a peptide that was binding to the LRP family receptors, and we showed that the TPA transport is quite decreased, showing that it's really dependent on this receptor. So we wanted to try this in vitro by, after that, because in vitro, in the normoxic condition, the TPA could cross. It was crossing through uh, this LRP, and it was, uh, we could interact with this LRP to prevent the TPA from crossing. But in, in, in stroke condition, what is it? So we um, designed a, um, a kind of uh, environment that could simulate the consequences of occlusion. So it's the, the deprivation from glucose and oxygen. So we place our model in a hypoxic workstation for two to four hours, and we assess the BBB integrity through the transport of Lucifer yellow. So in, it, in this condition, our model is increasing its permeability to Lucifer yellow. But something interesting is that when you, if you do that without the glial cells below, it does, not, it does not increase. So you need the glial cells to have your BBB permeability increased. And something interesting also is that the uh, tight junction proteins are not changed when, you, when seeing them under the 
uh, photonic microscope. They do not change. You don't have completely holes in the, in the, in the monolayer as you can find with mannitol, for example. So there is an increase of, uh, in permeability without altering the monolayer of endothelium. So the t in, the TP in this condition, the TPA increased a lot is transport, as you could guess very easily. But something interesting is that uh, its transport was no longer dependent on the LRP, because when you use this peptide that binds to the LRP, the transport rate was the same. So this has a lot of, um, of um, impact on the strategies that were at that time um, subjects, suggested to prevent the TPA from crossing the BBD and exert a neurotoxic effect. Because ad we thought that by interacting with the LRP, we could prevent the TPA from crossing the BBD and lowering the, um, the neurotoxic effects. But this is true since the BBB is really intact. Once the BBB is open, not completely disrupted, but slightly open, is not uh, true anymore because the transport of TPA is no longer dependent on this receptor LRP. So we need to pr also to preserve the BBB integrity to prevent the TPA from crossing the BBB. But we do not know what it is, how to do. Uh, does the BBB, can the BBB be protected pharmacologically from uh, the OGD-induced hyperpermeability? And we have found that phenofibric acid, which is a hypolipemic drug, which was found in 2003 to be neuroprotective to some extent, could be able to restrict the increase in permeability in our mouse in vitro model. And since the um, phenofibric acid is a ligand for the nuclear receptor piper alpha, we designed an in vitro model using endothelium from piper alpha KO mice. And in this case, we could see that the protection was no longer uh, occurring saying that in this case, the, the protection uh, done by fibrofibric acid was really dependent on the activation of piper alpha. But we have to remind the story of the NXY059 from uh, AstraZeneca, this famous ferrovite that was the first to fulfill the sterile criteria and that uh, should, be, should have been the first neuroprotective agent it was protective in our model. It was protective in the in vivo models from mouse to primates. But unfortunately, it, is no protect, it was not protective in humans. So from this, and it was in 2006, there are two ways of thinking in the field. Either the animal models are crap, and you can only re re rely on the human material. People think like this. or we may have missed something in the pathophysiology of stroke, especially since the, the studies were mainly focusing on neurons and not on other brain cells. I personally believe it's the second option, even if, of course, you cannot exclude that there is a specificity in only human material and human cells. So we are investigating this by trying to design a human uh, blood-brain barrier model from two ways, from stem cells, and also from deceased patients. We, it, take, it took two years to have the habilitations. It's just starting. We managed to get some endothelial cells with not good permeability. But the problem is that to have material enough. And as I said to you, these, mo these cells are not behaving like the bovine cells. I mean that by uh, uh, making some colonies and, may, and be able to keep their phenotype for several passages. So it's something we are trying to improve the, con the culture conditions to make sure that we can make a human model, but it's not really easy. But for the second option, the misunderstanding of the pathophysiology of stroke, we are pushed now to revise our in vitro model because in this, in, in, in this way, uh, this result shows that maybe the models are wrong. So we are trying to, uh, to adapt our model to the pathophysiology of stroke as it is in vivo. And for this, we are working together with people from the uh, hospital in Lille 
who are um, designing some uh, MRI studies. And um, we are based on the um, lecture of uh, some uh, of some reviews because uh, in the fact w the, the point is that is the BBB breakdown kinetic really well known especially in the early times of stroke when you you see the literature there's some review saying it's biphasic more or less and there are even uh, more recent uh, reviews saying it's progressive so how is it of course, if you inject TPA on the, on the blood-brain barrier, you think it's, in, uh, it's okay or not. You cannot be sure that, that you have a, a great effect without side effects. So that's why we try to assess the brain water status using MRI and using uh, MCO model in a mouse from uh, people from uh, Regis Bordet in, uh, in Lille. And we wanted to investigate the T2 relaxometry to assess the brain water content and also diffusion imaging to assess the brain water mobility and from which we calculate the apparent coefficient of diffusion which is the brain parenchymal tissue component so the water of the movement of water molecules in the brain parenchyma and a new component which is called D-star which has first been investigated in the liver which refers to the random motion of water molecules in the microvascular compartment because it has been it is extracted from very low B values. Our hypothesis is that variations in this D star could refer not only in variations in the microcirculation but also in the transcapillary filtration, so the disruption of the blood brain barrier. Why? Because this um, this value is a um, uh, is uh, according to a surface in CMS by millimeter square. So we think that the change in the, in the movements of water molecules in the, on that surface could not only due to the circulation of the, of the blood in the vessel, but also on the filtration of plasma across the blood-brain barrier. So the results, by uh, T2 relaxometry, we have found that there is a start of water entry into the brain from four hours of reperfusion. And this starting point was precede, preceding a major disruption, a major water entry that we attribute to the major disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And, uh, and regarding the uh, diffusion imaging, when you look this famous D star, we have also a peakwise increase at four hours of reperfusion. So, maybe it could be uh, a, bre a breakdown of the BBB. We have performed some uh, Evans Blue, and we have a peakwise also uh, extravasation of Evans Blue at four hours of reperfusion. But it has to be really uh, well evidenced, and it's not, uh, it's not one. We wanted to check now using our in vitro models. So we use our in vitro model in a hypoxic workstation as usual and but after that we return the model back to normal conditions with the same kinetic as in vivo. And using our mouse model we have found exactly the before after a slight recovery at two hours of reoxygenation we have a peakwise increase at four hours of reperfusion and of course we have this peakwise increase is precedes a same Profile, I mean, no recovery of the blood brain barrier is kind of biphasic, more or less, with since uh, uh, um, an increased permeability at 24 hours. So we have exactly the same four hours peak white increase in D star, in blue, Evans blue, in uh, water content, and also in the in vitro BBB. So we just say maybe there is something to investigate there. And since in our model, uh, we need the glial cells to have an increase in permeability under OGD. We perform the reoxygenation without the glial cell just to see what happens. And we could see that there is a progressive recovery on the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are able to, regular, to recover the baseline tightness progressively when the glial cells are not there. So the glial cells need to be responsible to the BBB op opening in reoxygenation. 
And what we have observed in, the, in our model is that the glial cells were dying during the process. So in this way, this mouse model is kind of lesional ischemic model. So we, to support the, this information, we replaced the glial cells during the reoxygenation by glial cells that have not been subjected to OGD. And in this case, the recovery was even better, saying that the endothelials recovered the baseline, said more frequently um, earlier at two hours, and that the non-injured non glial cells promote recovery of BBB endothelial cells in reoxygenation. And just to reinforce this information, we have used our classical model, bovine rat, which, were, which is known to open without glial cell death. The in the mouse model, the glial cells are dying, not in the, not in the bovine rat model. In this way, it's a non-lesional ischemic model. So we perform the same kinetic of reoxygenation and see what happens. And then we see, we have seen a recovery of the endothelial, the, of the endothelial cell in this model. And it was a long-lasting effect because it could be, it, it lasted up to 14 days. So in this case, the endothelial cells could be able to, rec to recover the baseline tightness. There was no effect, or, or no effect of reoxygenation because the reoxygenation by itself could not reopen the BBB since the glial cells are not injured. So in fact, once you have the glial cells injured, you are more sensitive to reoxygenation injury. So it seems that the, gli the change in the glial cell status governs the BBB response to reoxygenation. And finally, we have taken a look a little bit more carefully at the tight junctions what, that were not visibly uh, disturbed by using this uh, fluorescence microscopy. When you use electronic microsco electron microscopy, you could see that the, the marker could diffuse between the cells without disruption on the, of the monolayer, except to uh, a, um, a, few, uh, a few proportion of that at 24 hours after rapid fusion, but not under OGD. And we had the same uh, profile, more or less, with the bovine rat model, in which they are the main, uh, most of the permeability tight junctions were permeable during the OGD. So prior to BBB disruptions, it seems that the glial cell status is governing the, uh, the response of the BBB endothelium to reoxygenation. And it's quite important because in this, in this fact, it means that even if the endothelium is the first cell type to be uh, ex exposed to the damage of ischemia, the, the, um, the lesion around the, around the blood-brain barrier, and in this case of the glial cells, could be a driver of the, B of the uh, BBB disruption during reoxygenation. So, the, of course, you need to focus on neurons, on endothelial cells, but not only on endothelial cells, on glial cells. That may be a cell type that could be really interesting to, to look at because it makes the links between the endothelial cells and the neurons, for example. So, uh, I thank Romeo Sekeli, of course, for all this, and my, uh, my team, uh, Olivier Petro. Who is, who is investigating, uh, setting up the MRI studies, Caroline Miziorek for the mouse lesional model, and Melanie Kunz for the bovine rat non lesional model. All the people of the lab. I thank also Maud Petro from the team of Regis Bordet for the MCO model. Um, the, the team from Denis Vivien's lab that you may know maybe already because I think he has been here already, Denis? Yeah. So, because I've been involved in all these studies uh, with TPA and DSPA. Rustam Musbekov from the um, electron microscopy and uh, the team of Barstals for the PPAR Alpha stories. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>